To understand the fighting that followed, we must know something about the city of Shanghai itself. Situated near the mouth of the Yangtze River, it is the biggest city in China. As the largest seaport in the Far East, it dominated the commerce and foreign trade of China. And through its great docks and channels passed most of the wealth of the Orient. In Shanghai, truly the East met the West. And within this city of three and a half million Chinese was another city, the foreign settlement, made up of the French concession and the well-known international settlement. There, the various powers, including Great Britain, the United States, and Japan, had stationed detachments of troops, Japanese, British, French, and our own United States Marines to assist the police of the Shanghai Municipal Council in the preservation of peace and order and to protect the boundaries of the international settlement. These detachments were limited in size, but the Japs secretly and in violation of all treaty agreements had increased their garrisons so that when fighting started on the border of their concession in August of 1937, they thought they were fully prepared for any eventuality. of the Chinese counterattack almost drove the Japs into the Wangpu River. Backed up by the heavy guns of their warships, however, the Japs managed to hold out until reinforcements arrived. Jap landings were then made in the vicinity of the Wusung forts and in Lu Ho and Lo Tien on the Yangtze River, north of Shanghai. The Chinese drew back to positions five or 10 miles inland where they could secure some protection from the heavy Jap naval gunfire. At the same time, the invaders succeeded in making a surprise landing some 20 miles to the south of Shanghai, put two divisions ashore, and pushed rapidly north to outflank the city. The Chinese position was thus made untenable, and a withdrawal was ordered to the west and to the south toward Nanking and Hangzhou. But only about half of the Chinese army that had fought at Shanghai was left to withdraw. Meanwhile, enraged at the very idea of anyone resisting the Imperial Japanese might, the Japs took their vengeance upon the civilian population of the city, a city without guns or planes to defend itself, and deliberately slaughtered thousands from the air. refuge inside the international settlement, where Japan was afraid to bomb the property and people of the foreign powers, just yet. But there was not room for all. And for each who found safety inside, there were thousands huddled beyond the gates, standing helpless and undefended against the Jap attacks. There was no escape for these surging and panic-stricken people. 
They could only scurry through the narrow streets, pushing and packing themselves into the center of the city to be trapped and buried alive in the collapse of bombed and burning buildings. The Japanese introduced the world to a new kind of war. A war of deliberate terrorization, of deliberate mass murder, of deliberate frightfulness. When the campaign was over, the Japs occupied the entire peninsula east of Shanghai. Reorganizing rapidly, they then launched a coordinated drive on Nanking. One column pushed along the railroad while another swung further to the south. This column then split and continued its drive, hoping to cut off any possible retreat of the Chinese armies defending Nanking. It was here in the Yangtze that the blood-crazed Japs attacked an American gunboat the USS Panay, despite its distinctive markings. The ship was bombed and sunk with the loss of American lives. The first American warship to go to the bottom in this war. But officially, at least, this was a mistake, and the Japanese government apologized. Meantime, at Nanking, Chinese armies valiantly defended their city, which was the capital of the Chinese Republic.